Um, so I'd like to invite all of you to our January session of the Canadian Vintage Radio Society of Alberta and our special presentation for today. We uh, are going to be inviting uh, Don Shear to give a presentation on restoring old phonographs. And he'll also get into the chrome plating of uh, metal parts. Uh, he's got an interesting story to tell too about how all of this happened in his life and what led up to the present moment. A lot of restorations under his belt, so he's got a lot of experience in this area. I'm very happy to invite Don to take over. After high school, I took a three-year program uh, in music and uh, found this very interesting. It was also during those three years that I found my wife because she was also uh, taking the same program. After the, uh, the three-year program that I was in, it was a degree program, my summers were spent traveling with a music group and doing music for the college radio station. After that, I went to Ryerson Institute of Technology in Toronto to study uh, electronics and broadcast radio. It was there that I met several other music friends who connected me with others performing music in various venues and various styles. Everything from classical to gospel to bluegrass to operatic. After Ryerson, I then went to Radio College of Canada because that was a, a little more of a uh, technical program. And I got my first job at CKCK Radio and Television in Regina in the engineering department. I also took many upgrade programs while there, while I was working there, because in that industry you work shifts. So uh, you have a lot of time either on nights or you're on your days off. Um, CK Television soon found that I had a uh, background in music, so they offered me a daily uh, television show. Uh, there was a bit of uh, ulterior motive on their part, because in order for them to carry a broadcast license, you have to have a certain amount of Canadian content. So this was pretty darn cheap Canadian content for them. <laughs> We were also at the same time converting the television studio uh, and transmitter from black and white to color. As well, uh, we were building satellite transmitters in southern Saskatchewan to be able to blanket the whole, the whole province. It was a very busy time. It was there that I met a gentleman by the name of Ernie Strong. Ernie had just retired from CK Radio as the principal engineer. Ernie was an RCA trained engineer and he worked in his early days in uh, New Jersey with RCA and then ultimately moved to Saskatchewan where he had some family connections. He gave me the first broadcast transcription turntable that came to Western Canada with the provisor that I would restore it one day. The one day was 40 years later <laughs> because it had been in my garage for a long time. I will show you a video of the process of restoring that piece of equipment. Uh, it, by the way, en ended up, after I got it restored, over at the Museum at Alberta Archives. And that's where it is with a lot of other equipment that came from CFRN. I worked in broadcast radio and television for 26 years. Well, not quite 26, 25. And I also did uh, uh, consulting in acoustics 
and sound and then got into police radio systems for several smaller radio or smaller uh, police departments in uh, southern Saskatchewan and in, and in Manitoba. And also got involved with the RCMP in the um, depot division where they had the training school in uh, Regina. In 1980, um, I got a call from Edmonton Telephones and they were wanting some help uh, and I understood that it was a contract uh, and uh, they were just building, the city was just building the new uh, police um, radio uh, police station in Edmonton. This was in 1980. The interesting thing happened. They didn't want this as a contract. They wanted it as a as a full-time job uh, with the uh, with Edmonton Telephones. We had just built a new house in Regina. Uh, and this was a very difficult decision for my wife. My boys were very happy. We had three boys. We had twins and, and an, older, an older brother. And uh, they were all gung-ho to move to where Uncle Glenn lived because they were very keen on their, on their uncle. So they thought this was a good idea. While I was with Edmonton Telephones and then TELUS for 20 years doing various engineering projects and radio communications and acoustics, I worked with this fellow for several years. And he had just come back from, uh, you were overseas. Libya. Libya. So we became very good friends. In 2000, I retired from TELUS and went back to Comtech, which was the name of our com company, uh, which my wife then ended up managing because I couldn't be working for TELUS and also having some competitive uh, input. So she worked that company with some, uh, two, of, two or three of our employees. The interesting story, in uh, with TELUS and how I left TELUS in 2000 was they had gone together with AGT which made TELUS and then uh, subsequent to that bought BC TEL and that became also part of TELUS and it was during that time when the whole culture changed we need more women in management. So we ended up with a lady out of marketing who would know, knew nothing technical, but she became our manager. Uh, that was a difficult time. It really was. So when they came back and said, I think we're a little heavy on the engineering side, anybody interested in taking an early retirement? My hand up went up before the sentence was done. So that's when I left uh, TELUS and went back into uh, doing uh, Comtech. We sold Comtech in 2016, uh, but when you've lived a busy life and you've worked many times two jobs at one time, it's hard just to stop and do nothing. So I needed a hobby. So this is when I got around to restoring Ernie's turntable. And you'll see pictures of it here. Uh, it was an interesting project. It, it took up a good part of a half a year at least. And because I was at it in several different sequences. The uh, hardware part of it was fairly straightforward, uh, but the, um, the wood part of the restoration 
was a little more difficult because it was maple and laminated maple. And that was a real beggar to try to restore. So uh, you'll see some of that displayed in the video. Uh, er, as I said before, Ernie's uh, uh, RCA turntable uh, was it on, donated to the uh, Albert Archives uh, Museum and uh, along with some uh, gramophone uh, products as well. So let's look at a couple of videos and we'll start off with the um, with the um, uh, transcription turntable and then we'll look at a restored uh, gramophone, a 1920-21 gramophone restoration. Uh, this is quite short, it's, uh, three minutes. And then uh, several other restored, I've restored around 25, 30, uh, 19, early 1900 vintage uh, uh, gramophones and other, some other music players. Uh, a friend of mine, I think uh, you were, some of you were with me when we did of a, um, uh, a fellow who restored um, a lot of um, mechanical players. You know, the, 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 they, the, these were, didn't play records or any of that music. These were all just mechanical music machines. They were, many of them were like big, like player pianos and that to that type of uh, product and then we'll uh, uh, look at turn over to nickel plating uh, and and how we progress to come to that point but, uh, we'll have a look at the uh, 1929 transcription turntable this was literally it was truly the first uh, turntable transcription turntable to come to Western Canada. It was also the first uh, uh, experimenting with uh, uh, audio tape and audio tape players. So we'll have a look at that now. Then. Hi, welcome to my playroom. I'm in the process of converting uh, program materials from my past days from analog to digital. And I'm also restoring several pieces from the broadcast industry that I worked in for many years. One of the pieces that I've just finished working on is this RCA transcription turn broadcast turntable. This was built by RCA in 1929 and was last used at CK Radio Regina. I got this piece from Ernie Strong who retired as chief engineer and then came over to help us out at CK Television where I worked during the 60s. This piece has been in my garage for over 40 years so it was time to do something with it. This RCA transcription turntable was used at many radio stations to play hard wax discs. This is before the advent of audio tape, which came into common use in the 1940s. Audio tape players were very expensive, recorders and players were very expensive in those years. So Presto came out with a unit that simply piggybacked onto the transcription turntable and used that power to play, pull the tape across the playhead. Very unique. This unit had no motor or electronics, so it simply used the turntable to power the pulling of the tape across the uh, head. 
Lots of innovation in those days. to improvise on a couple of components that I couldn't restore so uh, some some of the uh, some of the pieces were uh, were fabricated the maple wood is a very soft wood so it it didn't didn't stand up for those hundred years Took a lot of took a lot of gluing and a lot of uh, of uh, fasteners to get it back together again. You know where it was actually manufactured? In uh, New Jersey. Yep. Uh, Ernie act Ernie actually brought that machine up into Canada when he was still an employee uh, and. Uh, working for RCA in New Jersey. Would Maplewood have been indigenous to that area? I don't know. I, I, it might have been. They had a gear shift on this to be able to switch it from 78 to 33 and a third. That's, that's where it, it was manufactured at that point. So I had to overcover it with, with, uh, with wood to be able to restore it back to its original case. Now let's get back to the Great Gildersleeve. It's breakfast time, but so far only Marjorie and Leroy have reached the dining room. Marjorie is reading the front page of the paper, and Leroy comics, while Bertie can be heard in the kitchen. This is the breakfast turntable that I restored some time ago. I recently found two 16-inch transcription recordings used in the early 1940s. Remember the great Gildersleeve? I remember hearing that show as a child. This is just some chipmunks on this tape. That's the way it sounds. It's not speeded up, it's just the, the chipmunk disc. So you're using an external amplifier to amplify it? Yes. And it I, would feed it straight into the broadcast? Yep. Mm -hmm. It would go straight into the console. This is the actual recording head uh, that, the, uh, that the discs were cut on. A very unique way of speed control that was uh, on this uh, machine. Uh, the next uh, video is fairly short. It's a uh, regarding a uh, restored uh, 
1921 uh, Silvertone gramophone. Uh, this, by the way, is unique in that it was Canadian built, built by the Heinzmann piano people. And uh, the, uh, the restoring of the wood cabinet was a real challenge. Um, it, uh, again, it's, it's got to do with the age and also the way some of the joints were laminated and were kept together. Uh, this required a replacement of the main motor spring, which by, by the way, the motor springs on these gramophones look like this. This is an eight foot uh, uh, spring and these, this then is placed into a little puck uh, container like that. Uh, and some of them will have two in tandem, one working the other way. And, but some of these springs are as long as 16 feet. So if you can imagine 16 feet condensed into that little, that little container, the, uh, the concern always is you got to watch your eyes when you're, when you're taking the thing apart. And you take it apart because they would break either at the at either end so that was that was the main that was the main concern so uh, I would just cut it and then re remachine the ends and then re, re reintroduce it into that container uh, the container then is filled with with uh, oil or grease and the big problem on these was that many times that grease is congealed and so it needs to be cleaned out. Uh, the uh, unique thing on the uh, next couple of videos is l keep an eye out for the governor. Uh, it's a very unique uh, device to maintain the speed, the constant speed uh, for the uh, turntable to turn. Uh, this piece is also gone over to Alberta Archives. Uh, this is working on the uh, on the cabinet. You can just turn the audio up a bit. Take that off, and basically with a scrub. A this is walnut wood. I like working with walnut and with uh, and with. Um, then the idea is... Not, not, not so much mahogany. Mahogany is a little harder to work with. Finish. Uh, that's a walnut I, finish. I try to keep the original it. coating to maintain the legitimacy of it a restored uh, device, piece. But again, you can see some of the, some of the joining is, uh, n needs uh, to be uh, re-glued and re-laminated. So are you actually using hand cleaner to take some? Of I have a variety of. It depends on the depends on the grease and on the uh, on the surface. Uh, this is the this is the main spring. That's where these there's two of these in this machine, one on the bottom, one on the top. So t typically, the first thing that, that has to be done is that it has to be cleaned. So all the, all the grease is, uh, and I've used a variety of degreasers uh, to, uh, to do that. I use a lot, the Dremel tools are a real asset because you have a lot of different uh, uh, scrubs, scrub uh, uh, heads on with the Dremels. This is the finished unit now. This now is, uh, this, this uh, piece there, I've done three of those and uh, one has gone over to archives, but they use the, uh, the recording is not on disc, it's on, uh, it's on little cylinders like this, okay? And uh, this is Edison, 
Uh, by the way, just as a side story, Edison was a very bright guy. But Edison was also pretty full of himself. So a lot of the guys that worked for him ended up later on becoming his competition. And uh, Edison then, uh, he got distracted for a while because he started this in 1885. And uh, that's, that's when also he got uh, sidetracked into doing uh, elect electricity and electric light, light bulb for New York City. So he got distracted a bit and some of his uh, competition came along and took over. His salvation really was Alexander Graham Bell who then uh, developed the, um, he developed the uh, uh, Edison's original was called a phonograph with these cylinders, okay? And they were laterally recorded, you know, up and down, okay? Well, these are pretty darn hard to reproduce. And the biggest industry was in the software, was in the recordings, okay? So his competition then came along and Graham Bell then came up with a way of lateral recording or horizontal recording, okay? Still in the grooved assembly like that and he called his machines the graphophone okay but it still needed a lot of refining it wasn't it wasn't the greatest and uh, then a fellow came he was a he was actually an employee of um, um, uh, Edison and uh, Emil Berliner a very bright guy very inventive and he then came along with, with the lateral recording, refined that, and that's when the platters came along. And those were easy to reproduce. And uh, so there was, a, uh, there was a whole, oh my, not dozens, hundreds of others then that came along as a result and, uh, and were, were building gramophones, as they were finally then called, okay? Did the platters use vertical as well? No, they use horizontal. Always horizontal. Always horizontal. Uh, right from day one. Right from day one. And uh, the, uh, it not only did it improve the, the uh, uh, record a bit, or the reproduction part, but also the uh, spectrum. The frequency response then was, instead of it being in that little uh, sp uh, space between uh, oh, 800 hertz and 2000 hertz, it then was expanded to at least 80 to 3000 hertz. And uh, that's when the whole market of records then really took off. People became... Uh, you know, people bought a lot of records, not just in Canada, not just in U.S., but in Europe as well. So that became the, uh, the record industry became very large, and they attracted a lot of good recording artists. And uh, so that was a, that was a, a big part of uh, that success. So that relatively narrow bandwidth of, well, let's use voice frequency, 300 to 3K, that was just because of technology then? Very much so. The best that we could do. Very much so, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Wasn't uh, there a competing format called Diamond Disc? Pardon? Wasn't there a competing format called Diamond Disc? There, there was for a period of time, yep. Uh, there was actually a, a, quite a number of innovators. I wouldn't call them inventors. They were innovators that would improve on some of the designs that uh, because the big challenge always was you can build a machine but can you build 10 of them uh, to make it worth your while so it was the it was the reproducibility of these that was always the big the big challenge the big driver and in part that's why, <laughs> and in part that's why edison did so well was it not he was more of a he was an inventor but he, he was an inventor business like where he wanted he he, he wasn't really he wasn't the greatest businessman. Yeah. Uh, 
he used a lot of people, and I mean used. Uh, anything you can you can you can look this up on the internet, but he 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 did not he did not do well because as an individual he didn't treat his people well, and that was a limitation for him. Okay, uh, let's look at these. These are some of the ones that I've restored. Some of my collection of restored gramophones and antique radios, early 1900s. The, the, the most successful uh, br brands were Columbia and RCA Victor, or R and Victor, and then they, those two came together as RCA Victor, and uh, uh, Berliner, and uh, there were quite a few of the music manufacturers, like Heinzmann, would uh, then became uh, large uh, manufacturers. These were done pretty much worldwide. But this kind of shows you how I got into this. There's nothing magic about this. It's basically high school chemistry. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very intriguing uh, hobby in what you can do to uh, um, bring something back to its original state. A lot of these machines, uh, I find them, and they're, they're either gucked up pretty good with grease and dirt and grime and rust. And uh, so uh, th you can clean them up, and not just the platters that we'll show you here, but a lot of the other fixtures as well, that, uh, you know, the handle and, uh, and the... Uh, the tone arms, the tone arms, and a lot of them end up looking pretty, not too bad for a hundred years. Um, but you'll see, you'll see rust on many of them, and it's usually along the sides where they've, they've gotten some handling, okay? The, um, the uh, uh, other devices on that top of that turntable that you'll see are these sound boxes, uh, and these sound boxes are are tricky to work on because they'll either have a mylar uh, diaphragm in them, which then is attached to that needle, okay, uh, and the gaskets in there uh, over a hundred years get to be pretty brittle, so uh, I can I can uh, access the uh, the um, um, gasket material, and so these can be pretty well restored to uh, to their original. And in many cases, they can be enhanced with a uh, with a broader frequency response. Okay, uh, this this was an innovation, by the way, of Berliner, uh, where he uh, went to still using di still using mylar as the diaphragm in there, but he mounted them in a different way, in a different way. So that gave you a broader spectrum of uh, music reproduction. Did okay. you run across mica as, a, uh, mica as a diagram material? Yeah, just a little wafer, and it's a little, it's laminated mica. And uh, again, depending on how, how well they're, uh, they're originally constructed is the will determine how good the uh, 
the frequency response that they will reproduce. But I, uh, our club had a bit of a uh, ongoing uh, um, debate about which was better, the uh, laminated, um, the mylar, or the laminated um, um, tin foil. You know, I, for I forget the name right now, but. Uh, we, we debated because I had played around with some of the mylar and I said I bet I can make one out of plastic that'll sound just as good as the mylar and I wish I'd have had that video to show you but uh, I, I fabricated one with the lid of a uh, potato chip uh, can okay, and used that as the diaphragm and it turned out to be <laughs> it turned out to be the better ones of the uh, the laminated uh, mylar and the uh, and the uh, tin foil so uh, but i i had the advantage of when i did that because i still have a lot of my old test gear from acoustic days and i with a spectrum analyzer i could not only make it so they could hear it but they could see it as well. They could see the uh, they could see the uh, the uh, entire spectrum because this shows you from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. So uh, we were I was able to illustrate it in that way, and I won the contest. <laughs> okay, um, on this one here, um, I'll give it I'll give a bit of an introduction to this is. On most uh, gramophones, this is what this is what they're con constructed or what they're made of. There's the turntable. There's the spring motor, and then there's this neat little device, a little governor. Okay, and that governor can be controlled. Then you can you can change the speed, slower, or faster, and uh, it is a um, it's a unique device, but it's also one of the most critical in restoration because uh, they need to be clean. And uh, I'll demonstrate that to you, can for you, you. Can you rebuild them? Yep. Uh, this one here, haven't, this, is, this has just been cleaned. It hasn't been restored. But the, um, it's, it's the three balls on there, three weights on a spring. Each one is on a spring. And as that flies, you can then determine the speed by how much pressure is put on the pads. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So that's what it looks like. It's moving and it's turning the turntable. Okay, and you can change the speed by this lever by just by how much pressure is put onto that. Huh. Slow it right down. So anyhow, it's um, one of the one of the the, uh, the big problem on the turn on the turntables is they get pretty messed up. This this is usually covered uh, by then getting the old uh, covering off of it and and fabricating a new cover that will then go on top of that okay so i don't clean that but it's this part here that ends up being pretty pretty messy okay and that's why i developed a way to to uh, uh, improve that or fabric uh, just get a better solution to uh, make it look like like the original. Um, again, before going in, seeing the video, uh, as I said before, there's nothing magic here. The uh, the uh, it's it's high school physics or, or chemistry. It, the the electrolyte is basically uh, vinegar and salt. Okay, and then you add the nickel. Uh, divide uh, the nickel deposit into that or you can buy it 
This is what the acetate looks like. It's a nice greenish, it's a nice green color. And uh, that then is used as uh, in the tub. This is copper. Um, with the shaking around, it's gotten a little, a little mucky, but it's a little lighter, a little lighter uh, blue uh, color. Okay. Um, the um, these pieces, these products, by the way, are readily available uh, from uh, on the internet. Uh, but the biggest, the best supplier that I've uh, linked into has been the Caswell people. And uh, they, they are a very reliable supplier, not just of the acetate, but uh, the, uh, the, other, um, the other materials for electroplating. This, by the way, is a nickel. The nickel uh, plate? plates. What are the nickel plates worth? Pennies. Oh. It's not. It's not expensive. This. There's a pack here of ten that probably cost me mm, ten bucks. To probably a buck a piece. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit about uh, dipping and using a wand and we'll see some of that in this video okay so let's have a look at the video if you're copper plating it would be a metal disc a metal plate as well pardon if you're copper plating yes oh i'm glad you brought that up because to get really good nickel plating surface it's easiest to copper plate it first and the nickel adheres to the copper. <coughs> copper is a little softer and uh, it also it also plates a lot easier. Uh, the acetate there again is the same. Uh, it's with vinegar, salt, and then a nickel, a nickel plate uh, that's used as the anode then for the as the as the giver of the of the ions for the uh, uh, plating to take place. So for copper, the anode would be a piece of copper then? Yeah, it's an, and again, a little slip of, uh, of that. Okay. Let's have a look at the video and then we can have some additional questions and answers. Okay, what I'm doing here this morning is I am electroplating, nickel plating, some of the uh, rusted pieces uh, of some of the gramophones that I'm restoring. And what I'm doing this morning is the turntable part of the gramophone. A lot of these were rusted and I've got four of them to do. And uh, the nickel plating will, uh, will clean that all up and make it nice and shiny. What I've done first of all is I've cleaned the edges of this because I want this to be nice and shiny and, and uh, plated. My apparatus here is a power supply over there that will go anywhere from 4.5 volts to 8 volts and uh, that is applied then to a nickel uh, electrode and I'm, I'm got the electrolyte in this tub, uh, so the edge of the turntable will is submerged. Also, I've got a wand that I'm doing when I, as I turn this, I will uh, I will even it even it out considerably. So if you uh, if you look at the uh, at the bottom where it's touching the um, the electrolyte it is bubbling. So that means the uh, nickel is being applied and I'm doing the tooth with the tub submerged and with the wand to make it even 
so that I don't over overplate and others are then left uh, left etched. If you look at this surface here, this is some of the original there, and that's pretty pretty messy. Then some of it that I've done earlier is nice and shiny. And so when this is all done and cleaned, it will go onto this spring motor of the uh, gramophone. And uh, it'll restore it pretty close to its, its original. So that's my hobby. That's, that's what I'm doing and it's quite a, lear a learning process and entertaining as well. Do you have to remove the old nickel? No, just just get it get it nice and clean, okay. and including including finger touch. This is a nineteen. Uh, this is a nineteen nineteen twenty. Uh, Is an amplitron. Mm. That's the little one that I've that I've. Uh, I, I like I like working with that wood. It's um, it takes a little more time to clean, but it it ends up as a nice pro as a nice product when it's done. I've got a couple of stills here, and you'll see what happens when you uh, you put too much voltage or uh, current actually. Uh, to the process. Let's look at the bubbles down on the bottom. And you end up with, uh, with hydrogen bubbles and that ends up being pretty, pretty messed up. So the only solution to that is you take it right back down to the base. Okay? My little Gremlin tools are, are ideal because I've got some fairly abrasive um, uh, brushes on them. But you definitely don't want that to happen. You don't want all those bubbles because they end up as, as higher hydrogen ions. Okay, just uh, have you got another another slide? Yeah, right there. That's that's something you want to avoid uh, at all at all costs. The tub, and uh, again, it's just showing the the. Uh, it's very basic. It's uh, and I use the tub with a little rod so I could spin the, uh, the, the turntable. Um, this is for you, Vaughn. You gave a voltage range of 4.5 to 8 volts. How do you determine? Uh, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you increase the, the, uh, the voltage and the current, uh, you, will, you will always end up with a, uh, with a uh, messy surface, okay? Can you monitor the bubbles then? Well, no, you, you, this is a trial and, a trial and error. Uh, the other thing that I found works well is having the electrolyte fairly warm and in some cases quite hot. Uh, I, I usually try to heat the electrolyte up to 100 degrees and then get it back down to room temperature. Sorry. Uh, Fahrenheit, yeah, it's okay. Fahrenheit. <laughs> um, Is there a way of removing the nickel plating? Physically, mostly. That's the way I've done it. Follows. Not really, no, because if it's done, if it's uh, nickel plating is very good for protecting iron and steel, and uh, once it's on there and it's laminated on there well, it will it'll stay. Uh, but, but, but you look at some of these turntables, we're talking about something that's over 100 years old. So, uh, and some of these have been stored in pretty dirty condition. So they've had some, <coughs> some uh, you know, access to a lot of being able to get rusty.
Yeah. You work with nickel plating over brass? Um, I haven't tried brass. I've tried uh, zinc and copper. They both work uh, work well. Yeah. The the best uh, the best uh, um, uh, resource for uh, <coughs> doing nickel plating is these Caswell people. They have a lot of uh, uh, if you just Google Caswell uh, nickel plating, you'll get all the information you'll ever you'll ever need to be able to do uh, to be very successful at, at that. They also um, they also have a this is the word I was looking for before the brightener they have brighteners that you can add into the electrolyte and that'll give you very much a chrome uh, finish a chrome surface okay uh, what else I have uh, uh, I have done both the dip. And the uh, and the wand uh, plating, and it depends on the on the piece that you're working on. Like with a big turntable like that, it's pretty hard to do that with a wand, just just a wand. And on that, I use the wand just to be able to um, disperse or deposit the uh, the electrolyte well on the on the surface on the surface. Okay. Is there a metallic component to that one? The ones are made up of these um, you can buy these little brushes, eh? And uh, basically um, being, being able to add the, the um, uh, cathode or the anode on onto this because this is in parallel with what you've got in your in the in the bucket, okay? And around that is just to be able to to uh, keep the moisture in there, just a little um, cloth band-aid type of a uh, of a of a piece on there. So the plating actually integrates from that fluid then. Yeah. It's on the yes. The yeah. Uh, this again, just it was easy to fabricate. It was cheap and dirty, and uh, we use it for a project and throw it away, kind of thing. Um, temperature very, very a, a critical element because uh, the warmer the better. But if you go too hot, it'll also you won't get a very smooth when won't get a smooth job. The the thing that intrigued me about this hobby is it leaves itself open for a lot of improvising and uh, and you also then get to the point of where you can uh, you can uh, put something together and you can get it looking pretty good so it's uh, I I enjoy working with the wood side of it and restoring the cabinetry but I uh, I do enjoy the the some of the smaller things relating to the hardware side of the machine. Thanks so much, Don, for it.